So the, the next presenter is uh, John Buffett, is uh, founder and man managing director of Keyspace and chief architect and evangelist of open source satellite program. John has nearly 30 years of space system engineering project business management experience uh, with a proven track record in uh, developing and uh, delivering complex programs. So, Cheers. John. <laughs> Thank you, Shazam. Yeah. Do you prefer this one or this one? Uh, this one's fine. Okay. This one's fine. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. And this is very complimentary to the, to the discussion earlier. Uh, and for me, it's not about whether it's an either or, it's an and. And how can we take a number of these initiatives and build upon them? So what I'm going to talk about today is um, something we're calling the Open Source Satellite Program, which is actually the development of a, of a, a slightly larger satellite. Um, now, this project is very much in its infancy, so we're sort of early stage in that development cycle, but I'll tell you a little bit about it now and a little bit about what we're planning to do and, and why actually we're planning to do it. So, um, as the introduction said, I've been in the industry now for over 30, nearly 30 years, um, been involved in 50 plus satellite programs, um, worked for many years with a company called SSTL. And we saw them very much as the pioneers of small satellites. So when I first started uh, years ago and we started talking about doing useful things with small satellites, people were saying, no, you can't do anything useful. Now, what groups like Surrey and others did was they took a completely different approach to doing space and radically reduced the price point of small spacecraft. So, so what we saw as a step change in the capabilities, and, and that was great. Again, for 15 years, we tried to encourage people to do useful things, and it's only in the last 15, 20 years that people have been able to say, wow, we can now do some really useful things. Fast forward a bit, and Jordi and the team and a number of others came along with a CubeSat. Um, and what that did was it, it, it radically reduced the price of entry. So not only was now space starting to become accessible, but now it was becoming very low cost, and, and even individuals could now start talking about how they could do their own satellite programs, which was phenomenal. Um, and what we've seen is all of those things sort of track on a line, as it were. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing the small satellites trying to come down in size, and some of the CubeSats trying to come up a size a little bit. I mean, one of the, the key things that you can't avoid unless there's anybody in this room that's managed to figure it out, is physics. Um, you know, we are driven by aperture. So whether that's antenna aperture or telescope aperture or solar arrays, physics gets in the way occasionally, uh, especially for some of the applications. So what we noticed is, is say there's two trends. But what was intriguing was both of those things basically were on this line. And um, what we found, say we're a, we're a system integration company, so we're a commercial entity, but what we're doing is reinvesting all that money into other programs, and this is one of those initiatives. What we saw was this need for a platform that was at the price point of a CubeSat, but at the performance of a microsatellite platform. Um, now, that, we identified that need, but that caused us a bit of schizophrenia, because as a system engineering house, I don't want to be tied to any single satellite platform. I want to be able to use all the good things that are out there. But there's this need. Nobody seeing that need. So we thought, okay, how do we address that need but not become wed to one single satellite platform? So we thought, well, given that we're all about stimulating the utility and application of space, why don't we take a completely different way of doing things and apply the open source approach, apply open source methodologies and make that entire development open and accessible? And so in answer to your question about power system pieces, as soon as we've got the team working on this and some of those rudimentary building blocks become available, take them, build them, and build them into your designs. So we identified this need, and we thought, okay, well, let's just not build this thing, have it as our IP and hold tight to it. Why don't we embrace the open source uh, ethos and make that entire satellite platform available to all? And that's what we're planning to do. So that's very much our vision, is to make a 25 to 250 kilo class satellite platform open source and available. Um, and a lot of people have said to me, you can't do that. Um, they don't know me very well. That sort of encourages me to try and do things. So that's what we're doing. And our pledge is to make all of that information available. So this is not just about the source code. This is about the schematics, the parts, the, 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 parts, uh, the, the me mechanical drawings, the source code, the firmware. Um, and we're designing this very much for cost. And my crusade at the moment is out trying to raise the money to make this happen. Um, as they say, vision without money is a hallucination. Um, so we're trying to raise the money to make that program happen at the moment. 
but really as we go through that journey, making all that information available. So one of the projects that we've got on the go at the moment, we're about to start off shortly, is some, some parts testing on the onboard computer that we're looking to use. So we will be doing some radiation testing on that particular part, and then we'll make the, the radiation results for that part testing available to the community so that other people, rather than having to repeat some of that, can draw upon their information and use that. So we'll be making all that information available as we go through the program, and the goal is very much that by the time we have that first one in orbit, that that full repository of information would be available for people to take and build upon. And why are we doing this? Um, so what we've seen, it's a bit of an eye test. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, groups, Surrey's, the orbitals of the world and others have done a great job at, at, at a sort of applying low cost space. Uh, the CubeSat communities and people like yourselves are doing a really good job here in reducing the price point of entry and really bringing some real innovation into small satellite engineering. If Many of you follow things like satellite news and some of the trade press. Um, apparently, the answer to everything now is the likes of systems like OneWeb. So the view is with these mega constellations deploying thousands of spacecraft, then you don't need to have um, your own design because you can just want, take one off of the production line from OneWeb. Well, unless your satellite looks exactly the same as the one coming off the OneWeb production line, that model doesn't really hold. So there's a lot of hype over here. Um, and really for the sort of one-off missions, the very bespoke missions, that's not necessarily a good solution. So what we're trying to address is this, this bottom quadrant really. So making a highly performant platform, 25 to 250 kilos, for what I call benign environments and harsh environments, so LEO being benign, MEO and GEO, and even LUNA being harsh environments. Um, and then something that's, to say, affordable, and how can we reduce that price point? And one of the ways that we're looking to reduce that price point is actually by trying to take labour out of the equation. So we're trying to go to a much higher level of integration than we're getting out of a spacecraft today. So the core platform elements, and I'll be very careful here, I'm talking about the platform elements, are in as small uh, an integrated package as possible. And actually there's a clear delineation between what is the platform and what is the payload. So bringing a bit of engineering rigour into the separation of those two elements and really targeting a design that has a level of above that we need for many of the applications. Um, I often hear people say, I only need a spacecraft to last for a year. That's rubbish. What we really mean is we can only afford a spacecraft that lasts for a year. You know, we want spacecraft that are up there and are, we can experiment with and use for, for many years. So overcoming some of those reliability and redundancy issues and having something with more rigor. How does this fit in with, with some of the discussions we've been having here? Well, if we come up with a, an onboard computer that has the redundancy and the rigor in a, in a 25 kilo package, there's nothing stopping us taking that same onboard computer and using that in the heart of a next generation CubeSat, for example. So there's a lot of parts in there that translate directly through the value chain. There's only a number of things that are very specific to the larger platforms. So there's a lot of feed across and reach across that we can have by actually cultivating and working with the community and, and linking those bridges up, which is quite key. So what are we trying to do? Um, and say this is very much early days. We're focusing a lot of attention at the moment on things like the architecture definition. So we have literally gone to a blank piece of paper and said, what does our architecture need to look like? And then within that architecture, what are the lower level functions? So let's not get fixated between the boxes at the moment. If you think about a wheel on a spacecraft, you know, three quarters of that wheel is common between one size spacecraft and another size spacecraft. It's only the motor, the drive electronics and the mechanical pieces that are specific to a particular size of spacecraft. All of the control electronics, etc., is very common. So let's redefine where the boundaries of a spacecraft are. So we're looking at the, around that piece. We're trying to focus our attention very much on maximizing the payload carrying capability of the platform. Um, most of the things that we're looking to do, even if it's experimentation and demonstration, the, the platform is an interesting thing, um, but it's what that platform's doing that's the important thing. Whether it's communications or it's remote sensing or it's a number of things is quite important. Um, so range of different capabilities there. So, so that's, that's where we are, and, and I'm not going to go into each and every one of those blocks, but it's, it's happy to discuss those further. 
Um, in terms of the timeline, so what we're looking to do is have that first spacecraft uh, launched early 2022. And so that's what we're working towards at the moment. I've got to be honest, the engineering piece is the easiest piece. The piece that's actually turning out to be the hardest is building the community. Um, that's all about people. Uh, and that takes a lot of time. And, and, and that, for me, is equally as important because there's no point as building an open spacecraft and not telling anybody about it um, because that sort of defeats the point. Um, so, yeah, so that's where we are with that. Um, we won't get there on, on one... Oops. Won't get there in one fell swoop. Um, we, we're more sort of realistic than that. Um, we know that we're going to have to break that, that vision into a, number of fell, in, into a number of steps. So we're launching uh, the first spacecraft will be, say, for benign environments. Then we will be looking to take that one step for, further in the future, maybe taking that architecture and shrinking that onto an ASIC and making those designs available. Now, people saying open source ASICs, really? Well, actually, there are other groups outside the space industry that are doing that. So the guys at Parallax, for example, with a propeller, that full ASIC is open source. So in terms of the resources, at the moment, we're putting out a few articles. We're looking at how to grow that capability um, and looking for other people to contribute into that. And then, as I say, as we move forward with the development, we'll make much more of that information available as well. So how to get involved, um, just drop us an email. Um, um, happy for, for anybody to get involved in the program and to participate. So that's where we are. That's sort of a very whirlwind roller coaster overview of what we're trying to achieve. Um, we look forward to having people involved and participating in the program. Any questions? Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, if you can expand a bit more about the role in this initiative and in this project uh, of your company and what exactly would that mean in yes. the second system? So, so, so our, we're, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are, as a, as a commercial organisation, we're, we're a, system a system engineering house. So we work with customers, taking their ideas, a bit corny, taking their ideas and helping them turn that into reality. So that's business implementation, program implementation, systems work. So we've got one group, for example, that are doing a design in the US. They're bringing that design across to the UK to then implement that and manufacture that. Um, one of the, we're also working with a couple of groups that are looking to launch commercial businesses who today are struggling to close the business case because they've got a great idea. You know, one of these companies is looking at... Um, um, using remote sensing, for example, to measure mines and things around the world, which is an interesting application. Got another group that's interested in detecting oil, oil spills and water leaks, for example. And one of the challenges they've got is they just can't close the business case. So they've got a great idea, but the infrastructure cost is too high. And at the moment, current capabilities do not allow them to close that business case. They, they want something that's a, a performant microsatellite, but they need it at the price point of a CubeSat. And so we identified that need. Now, we, are, you know, we don't make any money off the back of the open source project. In fact, what we're trying to do is take the money we make commercially and feed it into that to actually grow that capability. Where do we make our money? We make our money on what I call the missionization. So if we have a future mission that requires a platform with this capability, then we do the customization. But certainly the whole platform, this is, this is the whole idea is basically to use that to stimulate the market and actually raise the capability. Um, I had a conversation with, with Roland, one of the early guys who was working with Geordie on the, on the CubeSats. And when they did the first CubeSat, they just wanted the thing in orbit. So their view was, oh, it's only going to last a year, but you know what, that's okay. Because we'll get the first one done and then we'll move on and make it more performant. What they didn't realise was that they'd get the first one launched and then the community would go, that's amazing and that's acceptable and we'll carry on building them at that quality. And so actually sometimes we want to sort of try to, to, to bring the barrier up. So can we take some of these capabilities and have a, a, a slightly longer lifetime platform but more performant platform, for example?
Uh, I'm interested in the, the legal aspects of this because I was at the ISC last year and I talked to some startups and I told them about open source, space products, and they wanted probably to scare me off. They say that if they open source their sun sensor, they would probably be sent to jail because it's a dual use and uh, this kind of things. And I, I was really afraid after that talk, but I think uh, maybe they were just uh, bluffing or what's your idea about this? No, that's, it's, it's one of the reasons I spent many years with a foot in the UK and in the US. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing the design out of the UK is because we don't have the same export and regulatory regime that we'd have in the US. So if we try to embark upon this development out of the US, then we'd run into a lot of the ITAR control issues that you're talking about. By doing it from the UK, we have less of an issue. Where we do have a problem, though, is if we have somebody from the US, for example, that says, I would really like to contribute, mm -hmm. then we have to look at that very carefully. Yeah, it's not only the ITA aspect, but even in Germany and all the other countries, they have this dual US regu uh, uh, regulations that if it looks like a rocket or a satellite, then yeah, you cannot give out sensitive information. But I just wonder how much this really applies to open source. So, I mean, the, if for the public, it would be, look, this group is publishing information on how to build a rocket and then uh, an evil state is going to take this information and build a rocket actually and attack us. I mean, this is the public uh, perception probably and I wonder how we can overcome this or, or if there's really some legal threat that we uh, have to face. There are, I mean, what you're touching on is a minefield and you're right, there's, there's certainly, there is a view that basically we need to stop these things happening. And, and that's certainly where ITAR came from, was a way of trying to stop such capabilities getting into other people's hands. The reality is, all that's demonstrated is, is if people want something hard enough, they're going to go and do it anyway. And so one of the things that I'm quite clear about when I talk about the platform development is it's the platform development. What we're not doing is, is bringing payload into that mix. Um, and actually, when we talk about a performance platform, we're deliberately keeping the agility of the platform at a, at a usable point, but not taking it over what we would see as the, the boundary between being uh, uh, a, a capability and a, and a very agile capability, if that makes sense. But it is, it is a minefield. So it's less so of an issue in the UK than it is if we were in the US, but it's something we are very sensitive to. Sorry, I've only been on your website for a couple of minutes now. Um, I'm not finding a link to the source. Where's, where's the, the source for your plans and everything? The open source? So that's, that's say, it's very much in its infancy. So at the moment, all that's on there are some of the articles that we're writing. Um, so we're just beginning to build up the site and the repository. In fact, one of the things that we're after is, is views on the repository and how we structure the repository and how we organize the information. So that's something we're trying to sort out over the next coming months. Um, because that's the other point we're conscious about as well, is how to make it accessible. Um, not just when we get to the full, full mission, but between now and the full mission. And so what we'll end up basically doing is, is a combination of things. So a lot of, a lot of the material we're providing now is sort of PDF format articles. Um, what we're looking to do and how we do it in the short term on things like the radiation testing when we've completed that with one of the universities, how to make that information available. And so we just go in through that at the moment to figure out how best to structure that repository and organize it. Because um, it's not just source code, it's all the schematics and everything else as well. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, can you elaborate um, a bit some more on how can somebody contrib contribute on this? And uh, if uh, an individual or some students can also contribute? Yep, so, so um, basically just contact us and, and let us know what you're interested in and what skills you have and, and the areas that you're interested in yourselves. Um, I mentioned the, the part testing that we're doing or about to start to do um, on the onboard computer. Actually, there was a, another individual, um, um, uh, Marcel, who was uh, an enthusiast, has a day job, but in his part-time loves playing around with, with onboard computers. And so he's actually gone off and done an assessment of suitable onboard computers, um, or rather suitable microcontrollers and processors, 
and, and has helped in the down selection of some of those parts. So really it's open to, to the capabilities and the interests of the individuals. Cool. All right, I think we're out of time, so brilliant. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you.